All right, welcome to the Irate Gamer Remastered series, and this is season three. This was a very memorable year for me, and it's very special to me because this is the year where everything gelled. Everything came together, and it was a great show once that happened, I felt, because the room, you know, I, I put the finishing touches on the game room. Uh, I had a an outfit that I started wearing regularly, the, the blue outfit, of course. And then there was all kinds of storylines, and we had a recurring cast of characters that came back over and over again. And the the only thing I I hate seeing is that these episodes are, of course, in standard definition as opposed to high def. Now, I still had the crappy camera. I didn't upgrade yet, but uh, these were the last batch of episodes that fits in those standard definition episodes. And of course, this was also a year where the AVGN Irate Gamer feud was at its peak. Uh, I got more hate that year, I swear. And it was because of, it seemed like the more popular the episode that I put out, the more hate that I would get. And it was kind of interesting. Uh, of course, you know, I wasn't able to put too many episodes out during this time frame because I was starting to spread myself a little bit thin because I had the uh, the regular show, I had I Rate Gamer Neo, I was starting to do the history of video games, I Rate the 80s, I think, debuted uh, around that time as well. So I started spreading myself a little thin and that of course led to the demise of, uh, you know, the popularity of the show around the fifth season. But uh, yeah, the third season, a lot of memorable episodes, including the first episode of the season, which is E.T. And when I think back to the episodes done in season three, E.T. instantly comes to mind because after all, the game was dubbed the worst video game in history. Now, the whole reason for me reviewing this game, of course, it was the worst game in history, but uh, I started reading around this time this book right here called The Ultimate History of Video Games. And in it, there was a small little section about E.T. And what really interested me about the game was that, you know, how did it get this name? It wasn't really the worst game in history, but the circumstances around it actually made it the worst game because they made so many copies and then so many of them got returned because the game was bad and they were hedging their bets that Christmas season of selling a lot of copies of E.T. and they made thousands of them just because the, the, the Steven Spielberg name was attached to the video game. So they had all these unsold copies, so what do you do with them? You throw them out, you bury them in the desert. And that's what they did for this one. And at that time, that wasn't real, it wasn't common knowledge that's what happened to those ET cards. So at the very beginning, the intro of this video, I kind of wanted to show myself going out to the desert, uncovering these things and talk about, you know, look, these things are actually buried somewhere, which later, there was a, a few years later, a documentary came out where they were looking for the exact place where they, was, they were buried, and lo and behold, yep, they did find them out in some landfill, uh, <laughs> kind of like the one that I showcased in my video. And if you're wondering where I actually filmed that location, there was a quarry near my house that I used to jog in every so often. And in the middle there, if you kind of look out, it actually looked like a desert-like setting, something you'd see out in Arizona or something. And I thought, man, this is gonna be, this is the perfect place to film something like this. So I went out there, had my shovel, had my camera, and I just filmed for a couple hours. Took the, the video game carts, I bought a couple of them so I could act like I was digging these things up. Now as for the actual episode itself, boy, this one took a lot of time to put together. And this was presented in two parts because it was so extensive. Uh, you know, I was going outside, I took my bike, I was riding around uh, the, the block around my house to try to get the, the perfect scenes. And uh, uh, an interesting tidbit, when I shot that the outside shots on my bike, I couldn't have picked a more humid day. I sweat my ass off. And of course I started wearing the, the long blue uh, sleeved outfit with the long pants and oh my God, it was like 100 degrees out, I was sweating my ass off. And there's like one scene, if you freeze frame it, you'll see like the sweat just like pooling under my armpits. <laughs> oh, it was it was terrible. So I took a, I'm sure I took a long shower after that shoot. But um, yeah, as for the video game being dropped in the toilet, yeah, I actually flushed it down the toilet. I, I was like, what's gonna happen? So I, I flushed it and went down, no problem at all. I was like, cool. 
So yeah, I got it on film and it, it was just a nice little um, little thing for the video. But yeah, there's just a lot of funny elements to this one, you know, tearing up with the video game. I love that. Uh, and when I released this episode, man, it was huge. I, 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 I ended up getting so many views on this thing. And I remember when I released this, the, the AVGN fans were so pissed because I think at the time, see, I wasn't, I, by then I, I kind of stayed away from what James was doing and, you know, any news coming out of his camp. But, uh, afterwards I heard that it was like hit one of his most requested videos that he reviewed ET. And I guess he was saving it for a rainy day or whatever. And, you know, the, the ABGM fans, they're mad if I did something that they wanted him to do first. Just a, it, it was like back to back. I did Rob the Robot, which they, they were pissed off about. And then I did ET, they were pissed off about that. And it just, you know, the, the feud just went batshit crazy the entire year. So it was just insane. But I will say one awesome thing that came out of this episode was that a couple years later, they ended up doing a, a documentary called E.T. Game Over. And they ended up seeing my episode and they were like, do you mind if we take a small clip from this and put it in our documentary? I was like, absolutely. So they, they took a clip, put it in their thing, and they actually paid me too. I was like, you guys don't have to pay me. And they're like, no, we, we do this with everyone. So I'm like, okay, yeah, perfect. If you grab a piece of the phone, the FBI agent keeps attacking you. If you take a step in any direction, you fall into a hole. And if you get out of the hole, you fall right back down. One of the major design flaws of the game was that E.T. fell into pits. Damn it, shit, oh come on. And guess what? It now lives out its days in a landfill. Very cool. I'm in a documentary because of this episode. So, all right, here we go. E.T., the two-part episode. The movie E.T. was a huge blockbuster for its day. And just about everyone who watched it most likely remembers the emotional scene where E.T. almost ends up dying. Hell, even I get choked up every time I think of it. But besides the movie, there was another reason that would end up making fans cry even more. And that was the E.T. video game. Back in July of 1982, Atari struck a deal with Steven Spielberg to produce an E.T. video game. It may have seemed like a good idea at the time, but the demands of this partnership would end up causing the game to be labeled as the worst video game in history. First off, the Spielberg contract called for the game to be released by Christmas, which only gave programmers six weeks to complete the entire game. Secondly, they were also required to produce five million copies. Well, this just turned out to be a recipe for disaster, since Atari games usually needed three to four months to complete, and the normal production run was around 300,000 copies. Yikes. After releasing E.T., people were so confused and frustrated by the game that many people ended up returning them. Atari was now stuck with 5 million unsellable copies of E.T., so to clear out their inventory, they ended up taking the games out into the desert to bury them. And since I just happened to figure out the secret location that these things were buried in, I was able to score some copies for myself. So, time to dust off the old Atari and see how bad this game really is. Upon starting, we're greeted with a pixelated E.T. head with the goofiest smile you ever saw. Now I'm not really sure what a shit-eating grin looks like, but if I had to guess, 
this be it. After the startup screen, E.T. must travel around the landscape in order to find three telephone pieces so that he can phone home and win the game. Now the only way to find these pieces are by falling into these holes, which end up covering almost half the damn screen. In fact, there's so many of these things, I can't even take two steps without accidentally falling into one of these fuckers. Now since there are a shitload of holes compared to only three telephone pieces, you'll be doing a lot of hole searching. Nothing here. Nothing here. And big surprise, nothing here either. Oh wait a minute, here's something. A flower? I don't want this shit! Just give me a damn telephone piece! This piss poor attempt at trying to add strategy to a game just fails miserably. And the only thing that will help you save time during your search is a question mark symbol that appears randomly at the top of the screen. If you press the action button, the game will then tell you where a piece of the phone is hiding. So now all you gotta do is drop down and collect the piece. But even though dropping down is easy enough, trying to get out becomes harder than pulling a rabbit out of your ass. Ugh. The worst thing about this method is when you reach the top, most of the time you'll fall right back down again. Damn it! Shit! Oh, come on! Ah, fuck you in your hole! Now, as if that wasn't frustrating enough, you also have to worry about avoiding these FBI agents. These assholes appear out of nowhere and take telephone pieces that you've already collected away from you. What a dick! Aside from dealing with FBI agents, you also have to deal with this annoying scientist bitch. If she catches you, she'll drag your ass back to the lab and pull you way off course. Even if you try to run away from these guys, you'll either end up falling into a hole or run into a weird glitch in the game. What the fuck? I'm not going anywhere! Ugh. This game is terrible. If you grab a piece of the phone, the FBI agent keeps attacking you. If you take a step in any direction, you fall into a hole. And if you get out of the hole, you fall right back down! And before you know it, the timer runs out! Well, I've had it. This is absolutely the worst game I've ever played in my life. If ET wants to go home, let him find his own fucking way home. I'm sorry, E.T. I didn't mean those things I said. I'll get you home. Don't worry. Alright, let's try this again. Okay, drop down here, grab the first piece, search the landscape, grab the second piece, avoid this guy, good. Alright, the last piece. Got it! Now I just gotta find the spaceship icon and call the mothership. Ah, there it is. Now I just have to go back to the beam outside and wait for the counter to run out. Come on. No, wait a minute. Get away from me! Stop! No! Shit! Well, mother sucker, double fucker! Your ass is grass now, buddy! I'm gonna make you wish you were never born! Open up! This is the FBI! We know you're in there! Give us back the games you stole and we'll leave you alone! Ha! You hear that? They're gonna take your ass back to the desert, and I couldn't be happier! I can't stay mad at you. Come on, let's get out of here. I think we lost him. Come on, E.T., make us fly. Make us fly. Ugh. Ow, stupid game. Not more E.T. games. <sighs> the game E.T. ended up taking such a beating from gamers that no one even dared touch the franchise with a 20-foot pole. But almost 20 years later, Nintendo took the plunge and decided to release a few E.T. titles for the Game Boy Advance. The first one we're going to look at is called E.T. and the Cosmic Garden. Time to plug in the Game Boy Advance player into the bottom of the GameCube and get this game going. The overall objective in this game is to maintain a flower garden while keeping your pet from eating your plants. Now if this game sounds like a piece of shit already, that's because it is. The main thing you'll be doing here is trying to keep your plants alive by giving them water, giving them food, and fertilizing them with your pet's fecal matter? 
This game actually has us playing with shit? Wow. But not only do we get to play with it, but we also get to watch his pet take a huge dump. Just when I thought I'd seen it all. So after you manage to keep your plants alive for a certain amount of time, then it's on to the next planet. But besides the change of background scenery, we end up doing the exact same thing. In fact, this is pretty much all you do throughout the entire game. Wow, what a huge letdown. This game just sucks ass, and Cosmic Garden really needs to be shit out of huge cosmic asshole. Well, enough of that garbage. Time to move on to E.T. the Extraterrestrial. This game starts off by giving E.T. the mission of collecting 15 flowers that are scattered around the level. And the flowers are spread out pretty far, so be ready to encounter a lot of enemies along the way. Now, let's pause here for a moment. E.T. is only given one defensive move in the entire game, so let's go ahead and guess on how he handles himself against the enemy. A. He kicks them. B. He punches them. Or C. Runs at them like a fucking idiot. Well, let's find out. And the answer is C? What a complete asshole! Now the next level is a bit more confusing, as now you have to try to find your way out of a huge forest that's now filled with FBI agents looking for you. And don't let any of them catch you either, or else they'll make you give them a blowjob. Sick bastards. So as the game drags on, so does my patience. The mission objectives in this game get even worse as they go from entertaining to just plain stupid. Like this stage, for instance. Let's pause here for a moment and guess why we have to run around the neighborhood. A. To gather parts for a telephone. B. To find food for E.T. Or C. To collect pee blocks. Well, let's find out. And yet again, the answer is C, the stupidest of the three choices. I guess common sense really just has no place here, and I can tell that by all the pee and poop found in these games. I mean, hell, they even included a toilet. So what do they expect me to do here? Wipe my ass? This is absolutely ridiculous, but hell, if they want toilets so bad, I'll give them a toilet! Well, since these other games are too big to flush, just have to blow them up. Wait a minute, there's something written here. That's a telephone number. You gotta be kidding me. Well, forget it, I'm not calling. You're getting blown up and that's that. Damn you and your E.T. lovability? Well fine, I'll call him! Yeah, Mothership? I got your games here. You better pick these up before I blow them up! Alright, so here we are with Home Improvement, and now I don't remember exactly why I picked to review Home Improvement, but I think it was, has to do with uh, me wanting to cut a game in half, and I saw there was a Home Improvement game, and I'm like, hey, this just is kismet, I'm just going to review this game and, and cut it in half. And like I said previously, a lot of times I would pick games because I had this joke in mind or a series of jokes in mind and I just wanted to play them out. You know, what would be the best game to do that with? So 
The bonus, of course, was that this was a terrible game. So yeah, it just all came together nicely, and it turned out to be a great episode. Uh, and this is where you start to see me starting to bring back a lot of the characters. You know, with this one, uh, we have uh, Tony coming back. But the one thing I did do for this episode in the remastered series is I took the sprite of Tony, which was a Maple Story sprite, and I replaced it with the newer version of Tony, uh, just to kind of streamline the character. If you want to, you know, see him not change at all. And so that's my only Lucas type. Uh, deal with this episode yeah, so I hope you guys don't mind too much but this episode is also the first appearance of the the Wilson type character from Home Improvement which I later call Wilkins uh, the first time you see him he's actually played by my dad and of course uh, <laughs> he didn't go on to reprise the character I, I kind of took over in in season four with the character because after all you always see like something in front of his face to kind of obscure it so I thought what the heck you won't even notice the difference anyway but uh, my dad has, has since passed I'm sorry to say but uh, yeah it was kind of cool to see this episode again and we had a great day that day so yeah it brought back a lot of memories so, all right here we go home improvement Welcome back to another edition of Tool Time. I'm your host, Chris the Irate Gamer, and with me as always is Tony Borland. Bang a lang! Today we're looking at the game Home Improvement, which is said to be an ungodly piece of shit. So what do you say, Tony? Wanna to try this one out? I don't think so, Chris. Well fine, I don't need you. I'll just do this review by myself. So the first thing that pops up is the intro. A very, very long intro. So in a nutshell, top secret power tools have been stolen from the studio, and now it's your job to find them. Why they can't say this in less than 50 screens of dialogue is way beyond me. So once the game actually begins, you start off by walking out of the studio and into a jungle? Okay, hold on, just wait a minute here. A jungle? What the hell does this have to do with anything? The title of this game is Home Improvement, not Jungle Improvement. Oh, but wait a minute. If you actually read through the 50 pages of dialogue, it says we should start looking for the missing tools in the other studios. Oh, I see. So this is the magical phrase that's supposed to solve everything and keep me from getting pissed off? Bullshit! I'm pissed off already! Well, let's just go ahead and check out my weapons. Oh yeah! Household power tools! We have a nail gun, a hammer, a grappling hook, which comes in handy when building those birdhouses, and the Bimford 7500 Pro Series Jackhammer, which will drill a two-foot hole into a cow's anus in less than 2.5 seconds. <laughs> the upside to the weapons is that you get to operate all these tools at the same time without having to switch anything out. The downside is that sometimes you forget which combination of buttons operates what. Okay, I need a hammer. No, damn it, the hammer! Ah, screw it! And even though you start off the game with a jackhammer, I'm not even sure where the hell you can use it. It doesn't work here, or here, or even here. Hmm. Well, if it's in the game, it must have some kind of function. Let's consult the instruction manual. What the hell is this? Real men don't need instructions? Well, apparently I do if I'm looking for them. So instead of getting an instruction manual, we get this. A piece of paper that's not even worth wiping your ass with. So who's the bitch-ass cockadillo that decided not to include any instructions? I can't even figure out how to fire off the nail gun without the fucking nail shooting up in the air. Alright, let me just calm down here. After all, this is only the first level. How hard could it be? What the hell is that? What the fuck are dinosaurs doing in a home improvement game? Did some developer actually forget what game they're supposed to be developing? Because we get a vast assortment of dinosaurs, pterodactyls, and dragonflies. And how the hell am I supposed to subdue these monstrous creatures? With my trusty nail gun? What the fuck? God, at this point, deep frying my own shit makes more sense in this game. 
That's it. I've had enough of you. Stupid game. What's all this? Howdy ho there, neighbor. Wilson, what the hell are you doing in my house? Just thought I'd come to give you some good advice. I don't have time for this. I've got a game to destroy. Well, you know, neighbor, I think you can learn a lot from the Vikings. Even they looted the cities before they conquered them and burned them to the ground. Wilson, I have no idea what the fuck you're even talking about. But maybe I'll just give this game another chance anyway. Thanks, Wilson. Anytime, neighbor. Alright, let's try this again. Okay, so the main goal in each level is to go around and collect these five crates. Now the game really doesn't tell us what's in these crates, but you really have to wonder since they're jumping around like a damn Mexican jumping bean. Now staying alive in this game is pretty simple. As long as you have these nuts and bolts in your inventory, you can keep getting hit by enemies without the fear of dying. But if you do accidentally touch anything harmful before collecting any, then your kids will come out of nowhere and help keep you from passing out. So once your life is restored, it's back to the game. Oh come on! They stuck me right by the fucking dinosaur! Ugh, what a bunch of ball slapping shit! Well at least this game gives me cool weapon upgrades like the chainsaw and the flamethrower to help me out. Sweet, now where's that dinosaur at? There he is! Take that you overgrown piece of shit! Ah damn it! Man this game is frustrating as hell. I think it's time we consult the Game Genie code book. Alright let's see here, Home Alone, Hook, wait a minute, there's no home improvement? So there are no codes for this game? Ugh. I'm about to pass out from this freaking thing. Every aspect about this game is just downright terrible, even including the controls. Half the time my player goes skidding across the ground like a fucking ice skating princess. Oh stop it man, now you're just embarrassing yourself. Well, if you want to get anywhere in this level, it's going to take determination and lots of it. So, let's just cut to the chase, and do a split screen here to show you that I grabbed all five boxes. Man, gotta love the things you can do with editing software these days. So now my mission is complete. Man, I can't wait to get out of this stupid ass jungle. No! It can't be! Not another level of this shit! More dinosaurs, more enemies, and dissolving platforms? Damn it! I can't take it no more! This game sucks! I know what has to be done. Now that's what I call a home improvement. Yoink! Alright, so here we have Monster Party, the next episode. And uh, a lot of people have told me this is their favorite episode from this era. And rightly so. I mean, man, there's a lot going on in this episode. This is my Halloween episode for the year, and... Like I said, with the reoccurring characters, this time we brought back Ronnie, Satan, Evil Gamer, Joey, just a lot of characters coming back into the mix uh, for this story. And like I said, this is a very storyline driven season. And yeah, just season three, really, the, the Ira Gamer show really came into its own and started creating this whole universe of, of characters and depth that we've never seen before so like i said I, I i love this season there was a lot of running gags in this one the occult shelf uh with the tour bus and the evil gamer twist at the very beginning uh that was a late minute addition i was like wouldn't that be cool kind of cool if all the mishaps that happened in previous episodes were caused by evil gamer so that was kind of a twist that uh, i, I kind of threw in their last minute you know whether good or bad i don't know but one thing that really caught me off guard was this episode was the start of 
my show being memed. I had so many memes based on this episode come out, which uh, which of course came out under the, the guise of Boars and Doors, because I had a few sequences where I opened the door, I'm like, yes, can I help you? And people thought that was so funny, they, they would splice up my footage and put other people's footage in where I opened the door, and it's like, well, who's this? You know, they just ran with it, which I watched a lot of them. They're funny. A lot of them were stupid, but the funny ones, I was like, eh, that's great. I like that. So, yeah, it's so cool to be kind of part of meme culture that year. Uh, even if it was at my expense, still cool. I mean, if you're on YouTube, you got to have a sense of humor about things and yourself. And yeah, I totally did. I loved it. And uh, yeah, so Monster Party. For over a year now, I've been trying to take over the Irate Gamer show with no success. I hired the Predator to sabotage the show. That failed. I reprogrammed Rob the Robot to become a killing machine. That failed too. But thankfully, I have one more plan up my sleeve that'll finally destroy the Irate Gamer once and for all. <laughs> Actually, the house you're looking for is down the street. Thank you, sir. Ugh. I can't believe this. The biggest Halloween party this side of the city is right down the street, and I'm not even invited to it. But not only that, I've been getting people all day coming to my door asking, where's the Halloween party at? Ugh. Well, since I'm already in a pissed off mood, this is probably the perfect time to review another game. See what we got. All right, let's see here. What is that? The occult shelf? Where the hell did this come from? And there's only one game sitting here too. Monster Party. I wasn't even aware I owned this game. Well, maybe I'll just go ahead and try this one out. I mean, what's the worst that could happen? Monster Party is a game that's considered a cult classic by some, and a bad game by others. The game starts off by introducing us to the main character named Mark. On his way home from baseball practice, he's approached by a monster that needs his help in fighting evil monsters that have taken over his world. Mark agrees to this alliance, and the monster then fuses both their bodies together. Ugh, I said I'd help this guy, not share my body with him. Once the game begins, you'll start off by playing as Mark. But find the magic pill, and the boy Wonder here will turn into the monster for a short period of time. So we're basically operating on the Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde principle, and that's where the main character can turn into a monster and turn back again throughout the game. Well, I guess it's okay as long as the transformation doesn't last a fucking fortnight! This simple transformation ends up taking way too much time, time that could be better spent killing off enemies, like this weirdo who's engulfed in flames. Stop, drop, and roll, man! You think that's bad? Just look at these idiots who are buried upside down. The only way to kill him off is by literally beating their asses. Let's just hope he doesn't decide to shit on me. Now your main goal in this game is to enter these doors that are spread throughout the level and kill the huge boss inside. Now if you plan on entering these doors while playing as Mark, then you're making a huge mistake, because Mark is a pussy. The only weapon he has to fight with is a stupid baseball bat with a very short attack range. And this is really unfortunate since this boss requires 60 hits just to kill him. 60 hits? I'll be here all damn day! And this is the stuff that emotional scarring events are made of. Remember the water level shit they pulled in the Ninja Turtles game? Yeah, it's kinda like that. So if you want to destroy this enemy easily, it's best to find the magic pill first and turn into the monster since he is the better fighter. He can fly, shoot weapons, yeah, he pretty much kicks ass. Mark on the other hand just, uh, yeah, does whatever you call that. The only drawback to playing as the monster is that you're only given a few minutes to fight before you change back into the pussy boy Mark. So whatever you plan on doing, you better do it quickly. Now if Mark is clearly the weakest fighter in this game, how come in the intro, the monster makes him out to be some powerful kid who can help him save the world from destruction? I don't think this kid even knows how to save toilet paper! And for that matter, why ask an 8 year old kid for help when you can find someone older and with much more fighting experience? It's like this monster decided to pick Urkel over Schwarzenegger. What a shit for brains. 
But maybe I'm missing the bigger picture here. Maybe the game company decided to have the main playable character be a young kid because they wanted this game to be intended for kids. I mean, we get bloody heads, flesh-eaten dogs, and pools of blood on the intro screen. Hey Chris, what are you playing? Ah, <laughs> oh, shit. Now my cousin Joey's gonna have nightmares for a week. Now, each of these levels has around two to three level bosses. So after you kill one, then it's off to find another. So now it becomes your task of checking each and every door you come to and see if the next boss is waiting inside. Okay, this room is empty. And so is this one. And this one too? Damn it, you knuckle fucker! Why does this game constantly insist on wasting my time? We've got empty rooms, long transformations, battles that last 60 hits long. My time is precious! I can't be just wasting it on pointless bullshit! <sighs> what? Yeah, can you tell me where the Halloween party is around here? Uh, it's down the street. Can't you tell by the loud music and the people laughing and the spotlights beaming up into the sky? Oh yeah, I guess it is a dead giveaway. Uh, yeah, you think? Now once you've managed to kill all the bosses in the level, you're finally given a key. And this ends up opening the last door in the level. If you don't have this key, you can't enter. And you just end up standing there looking like an asshole. And if you look to your left, you'll see an asshole just standing there. Now each time you encounter one of these bosses, they end up saying some stupid one-liner that makes no sense at all. Like this guy tells you not to pick on him, but then starts launching pumpkins at you. Well, if you don't want to be picked on, then don't start throwing shit at me! I mean, what do you expect me to do? Just stand here like an asshole and take it? And if you look to your left again, you'll see another asshole just standing there. And just look at what this guy says. Oh boy, Mark Soup? You know, that's an odd thing for him to say since I don't even see Mark on the fucking screen! Ugh, let's just skip to level 2. Which brings us down into the sewers. And wouldn't you know it, not a Ninja Turtle anywhere in sight. Although I was able to find the Technodrome. Now each enemy in this game has their own unique pattern of trying to kill you. Such as alligators, minotaurs, ghosts, skeletons. Hey, wait a minute. That kind of looks like... Hello, hello! Ronnie? Oh, oh, you're playing Monster Party. I remember auditioning for that game. Oh boy, the long hours, the grueling baseball bat beatings, all this real torture. Ronnie, what are you doing here? Well, if you must ask, I was actually looking for this Halloween party. Whoa, well, wait a minute. You got an invitation to this party? Yep, I sure did. But I've got to be on my way, so I'll talk to you later. How the hell does Ronnie get invited over me? That skeletal bastard. Boy, this pisses me off just as bad as these zombies. This goofy stage boss ends up telling you to watch them dance. Alright, enough of this lame-ass choreographed boy band bullshit! Time for you to die! Huh, they don't seem to be dying. Well, maybe I'll consult the Nintendo Power Magazine for instruction. So all I had to do was let them dance in order to beat them? You know what else doesn't make sense? I'm already halfway through this game, and I've yet to see one reason as to why they call it Monster Party. You have to fight monsters starting in level 1, all the way to level 8. So how is that supposed to be a party? In fact, the only party in the vicinity is the one down the street, and I'm not even invited to it! What? Can you tell me where I can find a Halloween party around these here pots? Get the fuck off my property! What a dick! Man, this game is really starting to piss me off, and the shit they pull in level 7 really pushes me to my limits. Now this level has three bosses total, but you only have to kill two of them to obtain your key. If you decide to kill off the third boss just for the hell of it, 
then your key will disappear. What the shit? All my hard work for nothing. And if you look to your left, you'll see an idiot who killed all three bosses. At last we arrive at the final level. Now it's time to find the magic pill and head inside the last door. But wait a minute, the monster turns out to be no match against this boss. Instead, it turns out that Mark's stupid baseball bat is actually the more effective weapon. This unlikely turn of events actually makes a statement at the beginning of the game really mean something. Too bad you don't find that out until the last boss of the game. So after killing the last boss, Mark is given a present and out pops a beautiful princess. Aw oh, yeah, this is getting hot. Oh, yes! Ah, oh, finally, my day has come! I have returned to Earth once more to wreak havoc this Halloween season. Cover before me, mortal, and I may spare your life. Excuse me? I'm about down for no one. You douchebag! You dare defy me? Then you will die! <laughs> you will suffer a thousand deaths! Oh, oh, I forgot to ask you something. Oh, oh, this is getting so intense. <laughs> oh, is that Voltron? Yeah. Galaxy Defenders away! So, uh, you're only here for one day only, right? Yeah, so? Well, what are you wasting your time here for when we can be out having fun? Well, what do you have in mind? You know, I gotta say, this was a great idea. I'll say, this is one of the best bars I've ever been to. I can't believe how many times I've actually passed by this place, but never stopped. Shut up, Ronnie. Sorry. What the hell are you doing here? You're supposed to be killing him. Evil? What the hell are you doing here? We had an agreement, so kill the irate gamer. Kill him now. Ah, chill out and relax. I'll buy you some cheesecake. I don't believe this. You're simply the worst. Cheesecake, really? Yeah, it's pretty darn good. You know, that does sound tempting, but actually I don't have the time. I'm on my way to a huge Halloween party. Oh, come on. You got an invitation too? Well, mother... Who wants to hear my rendition of Monster Mash? The Monster Mash? Oh, great. Oh, great. I forgot the words. Oh, no. Oh, can you believe it? All right, so here we have the next episode of Aladdin. And I tell you, when I released this episode, it was a very polarizing episode. You either really loved this episode or you hated it. And I think the people that hated it were the people that loved this game. Now, to be fair, the only reason I actually picked this game was because I had this storyline in mind of doing something with, something with a genie, game genie maybe. Uh, but I thought it was funny if I went out into the desert, I found a game, I started rubbing it, and a game genie came out of it. And of course, that was my whole thought process for that. And this was, of course, back in the day where you couldn't review a good game, because if you did, people thought that you instantly thought it was crap. Same thing with the Contra. Uh, I love Contra, it's, it's not a bad game, but there's things you can nitpick about, it. and that's, of course, what I did with Aladdin. Great game, but, you know, I just nitpicked it. And people took uh, umbrage with that, but that is what it is. But this episode took a lot of time to put together. I mean, gosh, I green screened a lot. It doesn't really look that good because, it's, of course, it's with the old camera, the standard definition camera. And I wish I had that high def camera for this one because, yeah, the desert scene just, it does kind of look corny, but ah, well. But yeah, a lot of green screening. I, I had to put my friend Eric, who played the Wise Sage, into this, myself. Uh, and then Brad, my other friend Brad, he played the genie. I green screened him into all those uh, scenes and he had the, the, the dust underneath him. So a lot of special effects and of course, it was kind of weird. Uh, I needed to do something with the Jafar snake. I wanted to have me interacting with it. And as I was editing this episode, I was like, how the heck am I gonna pull this off? And it was like kismet, it's, this guy just emailed me out of the blue and said, hey, I, I specialize in special effects. If you ever need anything, let me know. And I was like, hey, you know, 
I have a job for you if you're up to it. So it's kind of weird how that, that all worked out. I mean, if you don't believe in, in divine intervention, that right there just made me a believer. So that was really, really cool. Now, one last thing I want to add to this commentary is the very ending sequence where the genie kind of hides in the game genie. Now, I did this because I wanted to do something in the future with a with the plot that never materialized uh, the way I imagined. I was going to do something where I needed a game genie for something. It came back and started wreaking havoc again. Never explored that option, but he did come back in season five, which we'll explore, you know, when I when I do a uh, remastered series for that. But for now, here is Aladdin. Man, this map is useless. I can't even find anything on here. Where'd you buy such a stupid map anyway? I bought it off some guy back in the city we were in. He said it would lead us to a secret cave full of lost treasure, too. A secret cave full of lost treasure? Yeah, that's the main reason I bought it. You know, for being a wise sage, you sure do have your fair share of dumbass attacks. Wait a minute. What's this? A video game. And what's that doing way out here? I don't know and I don't care. I'm hot, I'm tired, and I'm sick of looking at nothing but desert for miles and miles. I just wish we were back home, sitting back, relaxing. What the hell? How did we get back here? Ah, oh, yes, it's because you wished it. Whoa, a genie! Yes, I am indeed a genie. You rubbed the magic game, and I granted your first wish. Now, you have two remaining. Hey, wait a minute. Do I get three wishes too? Well... I don't see why not. Sure. Alright. Well, for my first wish, I wish to be alive again. Very well. It is granted. Whoa, all right. It's time to get drunk and find me some bitches. Now then, what is your second wish? Actually, that's going to have to wait, because right now, I've got another game to review. Very well, but don't take too long. My rug is double parked outside. Aladdin for the Super Nintendo is your basic run-of-the-mill video game that was adapted from the movie. And although this game is not as bad as it could have been, it does contain a few things that just piss me off. First off, let's talk about weapons, because the only thing you have to defend yourself with in this game are apples. So that's it? This is the best we could do? You gotta be kidding me. These stupid things are useless, as they only end up stunning the bigger enemies for a few seconds rather than killing them. But it makes as much sense as taking a shit on a bunch of apples and calling it apple dumplings. Now, another irritating feature is the little monkey that follows you around. I wouldn't mind so much if he actually did something, but he doesn't do a damn thing! Throughout most of the game, this monkey will follow right behind you. He'll follow you into caves, over mounds of gold, and, well, that's pretty much it. Because when you reach the more dangerous parts of the game, he's nowhere to be found! It's only after you reach the other side of these dangerous areas that you'll see your monkey friend just sitting back and relaxing. Wow, what a lazy bitch-ass monkey fuck! But if you think that's bad, just wait until you go fight the first level boss. It's here that Abu finally decides to leap into action and help me out. It's just too bad he's standing 10 feet away from the fucking fight. And thanks for all your help, buddy. Hope you don't hurt yourself punching all the empty air up there. Now, whenever you finish one of these desert levels, the monkey pulls out an apple and actually starts eating it like he accomplished something. All I gotta say is that better not be one of my apples. What the hell? 
Hey, cut that out! Oh, you little piece of monkey shit! Get over here! Now, throughout the entire course of the game, you'll be seeing two types of jewels, green ones and red ones. The green ones you can grab with no effort at all, but the red ones, on the other hand, require you to be some kind of Dick Grayson acrobatic asshole just to get close to one. What really pisses me off about these things is how they place them just out of your reach. Just how the hell do they expect me to jump this far? Well, maybe if I get a nice running start, I can do it. All right, here we go. Oh, come on! Now I've got to waste my time climbing back up the platforms, avoid getting hit by enemies, and dodge their stupid arrows. Boy, what the hell was I thinking? There's no way I can reach that. But maybe if I try jumping from the higher platform. All right, let's try this. You son of a bitch! Look how close I was! Ugh, somebody call 911, because I was robbed. Now the really screwed up part is there are about 60 of these stupid things spread throughout the entire game. And the only way to make these things worth collecting is if you're skilled enough to grab every single one. But if you expect to score a kick-ass prize for finishing this ungodly task, then get ready to blow a fucking gasket, because the only prize you'll be receiving are alternate ending credits. So that's it? I did all that work for this? Well, what a piece of shit! I wiped my ass with your alternate credits. I think a better prize would have been the ability to play the game as another character, like Abu or Jafar. Whoa, what happened to you? I don't even want to talk about it. But you were only gone for like five minutes. Genie, for my second wish, I wish to be alive again. All right, your second wish is granted. All right. Uh, why don't you just stick around here this time so you don't get into any more trouble? Yeah, you're probably right. Maybe I'll just go watch Dr. Quinn Medicine Woman. I just bought the first season on DVD. Now the most annoying thing in this game has to be the stupid log ride you reach in level 2. First off, the logs move incredibly slow. And secondly, you'll be running into these small bats every 5 seconds. One wrong move, and they'll knock your ass back into the deadly abyss below. These damn things don't leave you alone for anything. And once they knock your ass into the water, it's a straight drop right down into hell. Where the hell are these things coming from? Now if you hated the log ride, I guarantee you're going to hate this flying carpet level even more. Since anything you touch here will instantly kill your ass. Touch the ceiling you die, touch the ground you die, touch the lava you die. Even if you think about touching anything in this level, you will die. And the worst part is that the lava keeps forcing you to the front of the screen, so you can't even see what the hell is coming at you. SHIT! Now the next two levels in this game really pissed me off, since they have absolutely nothing to do with the movie whatsoever. First off in level 3, you get transported to a genie land. And it's here that we get to jump on Genie's head, Genie's hands, and Genie's balls. But the next stage gets even worse, as now you run around inside of a pyramid fighting off birds made out of sand. Just when the hell did this shit happen in the movie? Man, this stuff is ridiculous. Genie, for my second wish, just get me past all these stupid levels. Very well. At last we reach the final level, and it's here that we come face to face with the last boss, Jafar. Basically all you have to do here is dodge his lightning attacks, and bash his head in a few times after he floats down towards the bottom of the screen. But after you win this battle, don't expect this game to end just yet, because now Jafar takes on the form of a snake. Even though he's a lot bigger here, he's still pretty easy to take down. Just hit him on the head a few times, and you'll end up killing him off in no time. So this is supposed to be the final battle? Wow, I was wishing for more of a challenge. Your last wish is granted. Uh, where the hell did the snake go? Hey, 
what's all the racket in here? A snake! Oh, shit. Why, Sage? Help! What the hell? That's it. I've had it. This genie has caused us nothing but trouble. Genie, for my last wish, I wish we never met you. What? <sighs> Very well. I will grant you your last wish. Where in God's name are we? I don't know. I think we're just walking in circles now. We should have just bought a map while we were back in town. Now which way do we go? That's a good question. Well that's it. We're getting the hell out of here. Time to go home. They can't get rid of me that easily. Maybe I'll hide in there. <laughs> Alright, so here we are with the episode of Kool-Aid Man. Now, I always loved Kool-Aid Man. He was a big part of my childhood. And I just had to review the video games. And around this time, he was starting to re-enter pop culture, especially with Family Guy. So I thought this is a great time to review Kool-Aid Man. And I actually built a Kool-Aid Man outfit for this episode. It took me a couple weeks, a lot of supplies. I To actually build a Kool-Aid Man outfit, I had to use cardboard and uh, foam and a bunch of fabric that, oh man, I just got a bunch at Joanne Fabrics and <laughs> made this, this Kool-Aid Man outfit, which fell apart a few years later. But uh, yeah, it, it was really cool. And for the longest time, I'm like, how the heck am I gonna have him exploding through the wall? And I kind of Photoshopped the sequence frame by frame by frame where he appears slowly and, and comes out of the wall. And of course, <laughs> to, to make the hole in the wall, I, I took a, a black trash bag, cut it up, put it on the wall so when you look at the hole in the wall yeah it's a, a trash bag if you look hard enough and I know I covered this previously but this episode I actually was working on this episode months prior to actually releasing it uh, it was going to be an inclusion of season two but my computer crashed on me while I was getting just down to the final moments of of rendering this episode out computer crashed got the blue screen of death I was devastated I'm like oh my gosh I almost had this done and I went to a few recovery places where they recover uh, hard drives could not figure out how to get information off this disc so I was devastated I'm like my gosh I spent like an, a whole month on this thing so I ended up doing something else I don't remember what it was but for months this episode just stuck in my crawl I'm like I gotta get Kool-Aid Man out and so it finally showed up in season three here we go finally Kool-Aid Man Kool-Aid Man was a huge advertising icon for kids growing up in the 70s and 80s. And in the old television commercials, he would smash his way into a room whenever kids were looking for something to drink. His popularity was so huge that it even crossed over into the realm of video games. Now there are two different Kool-Aid games that were made, one for the Atari and one for the Intellivision. Now since both these games are completely different from each other, for this review, we'll be looking at both. First, let's go ahead and check out the Atari version. Now, the first thing we see in this game is the familiar scene of Kool-Aid Man bursting through the wall. And this is a very nice touch, because what could be cooler than that? Oh yeah! Kool-Aid Man! Oh yeah! What the hell? That's my wall you just destroyed! 
Oh yeah! Damn it, Kool-Aid man, I'm in the middle of a game review. Get the hell out of here! Okay! How come all these interruptions always happen on my show? Alright, so after the nostalgic intro, the game begins and you get to play as Kool-Aid Man. Now the enemies in this game are colored balls that fly back and forth across the screen, and depending on where they're released, determines their color. In this row we only find red balls. In this row, we find orange balls. And in this row, we find the dreaded blue balls, which is the true enemy of males everywhere. Now these enemies are called thirsties, and in this game, they travel around the screen and randomly stop to extend a straw into the pool of water below in order to start sucking it dry. Now as Kool-Aid Man, your job is to collect these thirsties only while they're drinking, because if you touch them while they're moving, SHIT! They bounce your ass across the screen! This especially gets annoying later in the game, when the enemies keep knocking you into other enemies over and over again. Oh, come on! This also becomes a pain in the ass when the water's almost gone, and he can't even collect the enemy in time. SHIT! Now thankfully, there are also a few power-up items you can pick up in this game. Periodically, letters will randomly fly across the screen, and each one represents a different ingredient that makes up Kool-Aid. If you manage to catch just one, your player will go from being a sissy small pitcher of Kool-Aid into a huge hulking invincible Kool-Aid killing machine! Nothing will stand in your way now! Oh yeah! Oh yeah! Oh yeah! Ah, God damn it, Kool-Aid Man again? Oh yeah! <laughs> Don't you realize I have a door? Oh yeah! <sighs> Just get the hell out of my house! Okay! Now each level has 30 enemies you have to destroy. Once you've gotten them all, you get to advance to the next level, and everything moves just a little bit faster than before. But even though level 1 is pretty simple to beat, just wait until you reach level 50. Holy shit! <sighs> Out of hell with this game. Now for those of you who can't get enough of the big red guy, there was also a second game produced for the Intellivision. Now upon starting, you take control of two kids and their mission is to go around a huge three-story house and collect the three ingredients that make up Kool-Aid. Now after locating one, it's your job to pick it up and bring it over to the kitchen area. And you can tell it's a kitchen by the giant sink. Now each kid can carry one item, and this really comes in handy when you're trying to beat the game's 10 minute time limit. Now during all your running back and forth, you'll also notice that there are two thirsties roaming around the house. Instead of touching them like in the Atari version, you'll want to avoid these guys at all costs, because if you get too close to them, they'll change direction and start to chase after you. Now this is something that you don't want to happen, because if they manage to catch up to you, one of the kids will be frozen in place. Get hit a second time, and the game will be over. This especially sucks when both kids are carrying items, because the item also gets frozen in place along with the kid. Not even a Final Fantasy item will cure this petrification, Damn. Now grabbing both the Kool-Aid mix and pitcher items are pretty easy to do, but the sugar on the other hand is placed just out of your reach. The only way to grab it is by finding the step ladder that's directly above it. So after grabbing the ladder and bringing it back to the table, it's time to grab the sugar. But not so fast, because you also have to make sure you drop it directly in front of the table. If you place it just off to the right, you'll climb up and won't be able to reach it. Place it off to the left, you'll climb up and, um, where the hell am I? Now, if you fail to make Kool-Aid before the timer runs out, you'll end up getting the big fat game over screen. And rightly so, because even if you can't make Kool-Aid in real life in under 10 minutes, it's pretty much game over for you too there, pal. Damn it! 
All right, so after you've collected all three ingredients and placed them in the kitchen, you'll finally be able to make Kool-Aid and summon the Kool-Aid Man. Now it's time to sit back and watch the magic begin. Oh yeah! Oh yeah! Oh come on, Kool-Aid Man! Why the hell you keep destroying my house? Oh yeah! You burst in here one more time and your days are numbered, pal. Okay. So after Kool-Aid Man smashes his way into the game, your job now is to hunt down the Thirsties that were chasing after the kids. Once you've found them both, the mission is over and you get to advance to the next level. Now you get the pleasure of doing it all over again. Again and 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 again until you lose your mind from making Kool-Aid. Well, I'm starting to get sick of this game. Oh yeah! Oh, that's it, Kool-Aid man. You jumped through your last hole, buddy. Oh no! Time to get me some Kool-Aid. Oh no! Oh no! Oh no! Now back to Ronnie the Skeleton's Christmas Special. Oh, oh, look, it's snowing. I can't believe it. It's another Christmas miracle. Boy, I love this show. Looks like I'm going to need some more Kool-Aid. Oh, oh, gather around, people. We're going to sing some Christmas carols. Oh, oh, this is going to be great. Great stuff. All right, so now we're at the last episode of season three, the two-part episode of Mario's Missing slash Mario's Time Machine. And I released this in two parts. And this is the last of the standard definition episodes because after this episode, I was like, you know what? The show's growing. I'm, I'm starting to make money off this show. So I'm gonna upgrade my camera, upgrade my equipment, software, computer software, all that good stuff. So. Things only exploded from here in, in, in scale and grandeur. Now, there were a couple other episodes that I released in season three that got shifted to season four, and those were the history of video game series. I think I did uh, three episodes of that, and with the first one being actually episode 25, so wherever that falls. But once I got the new cameras and things like that, I ended up going back and reshooting the history of video game series in HD because I started having schools contact me and asking me if they could show those episodes in their classroom. And I was like, absolutely, that, that's the coolest thing I ever heard. So yeah, and I have had so many people contact me since saying, hey, I watched you in my class. So that, that was really cool to hear. And that's you know why I went back and uh, refilmed those so all the history of video game series could be in HD. So yeah, that's why I shifted those out of season three. But of course, now we're on to the last episode, which is the Mario is Missing episode. And boy, I tell you, the, the storyline in this one is just a cut above everything else in season three. And the storyline here is actually based on a movie what, called Sliding Doors which starred Gwyneth Paltrow. And I know uh, a few sitcoms actually adapted that storyline, uh, like Frasier, they did an episode where timelines switched back and forth depending on the character's decisions. So that's where the that's where I got the idea for that, this episode. And I thought, you know, since we have Mario's Missing and Mario's Time Machine, two different franchises, it'd be kind of funny if, if the timeline kind of shifted based on me picking either game. So very, very ambitious story to throw into an IRA Gamer episode. And I tell you, this took me a lot of time in the script writing phase because I had to make sure everything flowed nicely. And I'm like, okay, well, where does one timeline de deviate where the other one, you know, leads to a good path and the other one is a path that leads to all kinds of tragedy. So. Yeah, I hope you like this one. Brought back Ronnie, of course, and by then, you know, Ronnie, people started loving and r warming up to Ronnie because he was just placed in some really good situations. And the ending bit with the photographs is actually based on a movie called National Lampoon's Vacation. And I tell you, when I, when I worked on those photographs, my God, it took me, I think 
a half a week or a week just to make those seven or eight images, which was done totally in Photoshop. I mean, I was dedicated to my craft, man. I, even though it's only like a, a 20 to 30 second clip, man, I spent all week on that. But uh, yeah, I, it was a labor of love and it, it just made season three that much better. In the early 1990s, Super Mario World became an instant hit with gamers, so Nintendo in turn made two more Mario titles. But instead of making another fun side-scrolling adventure game, they made two shitty educational games. And these were called Mario's Time Machine and Mario is Missing. Now I only have time to review one of these games, so which one should I choose? Now I'm sure that reviewing either of these games will affect the outcome of my day, so I should probably choose wisely. Well, I guess I'll review Mario is Missing. Okay, so the story is Mario's been kidnapped. So for this game, you'll be playing as Luigi. Now picking any of these doors in the main area will transport you to a different city around the world. And you'll quickly learn by talking to the townspeople that these cities are being overrun by Koopa Turtles. Hey, there's another one. Hey, what the hell? Did I just walk right through them? What kind of bullshit game is this? Sure, you can bash their brains in all you want, but they won't be able to do a damn thing about it. So wait a minute, this game pretty much gives you diplomatic immunity. Sweet! Hey, maybe I can get away with pissing on public property too. Oh yeah, that's the stuff. Okay, so after picking up an item a Koopa Turtle has dropped, it's then time to take it over to an information booth. Now what I find odd at this point is that the receptionist doesn't take the item back right away. Instead, she'll just sit there and ask you a bunch of questions. Hey, what the hell do you think this is, lady? The Spanish Inquisition? Just take back the damn item already. So once Luigi returns all three stolen items and Mario is missing, it's now time to get the hell out of here. So after returning back to the main area and picking another door, you'll arrive in a brand new city, and your long and boring search for three more items will begin all over again. Well, you lucky bastard. Now this game has a total of 14 boring as shit levels to explore, so if you manage not to hang yourself by the end of this game, then consider yourself a winner. Oh, oh, you're playing a Mario game! You mind if I watch? Well, if you don't mind being bored to tears, be my guest. Oh, this is great! So after completing all the levels, we then arrive at the last boss of the game. And just what the hell is this? A Koopa Bull? He can't even hurt you either. What a joke. So after you defeat this stupid thing, you'll be able to free Mario from his prison, and you'll get a screen that just says, Thank you? Oh come on, this is all I get? You gotta be shitting me! I played this game for over three hours! So Mario's missing is a piece of shit. Should just pick the other game. Now I only have time to review one of these games, so which one should I choose? Now I'm sure that reviewing either of these games will affect the outcome of my day, so I should probably choose wisely. Well, I guess I'll review Mario's Time Machine. In this game, you take control of Mario, and in the first area, Mario has a choice of picking from any of these seven doors. After picking one, You'll then enter into an area that's a classic throwback to the first Mario Brothers game. So after defeating all three turtles and picking up the item they leave behind, it's time to head over to your time machine and figure out which time period the item belongs to. So since we picked up a torch, odds are it came from ancient Greece. In each time period, your mission objective is to return the item from the area it was stolen. And figuring this out should be pretty simple. I mean torch, torch stand, yeah that's a no brainer. So after you've successfully returned the item, the day is saved. Now you return back to the first area to pick another door, and fight off another set of turtles. Oh boy, another set? So after you've defeated this set of turtles, they now drop an apple. 
so this probably belongs to the time of Sir Isaac Newton. At the end of this level, we come to a huge tree. So the only thing left to do now is to drop off the item. Wrong location? Son of a bitch! Ugh, and now the game bitch slaps you by having a little bird fly across the screen to take the item away from you. What a dick! Now you have no choice but to head back to your time machine, re-enter the same door, kill three more turtles, grab the dropped item, hop your happy ass back into the time machine, return to the level, and head back to the tree. Whew, I thought this game was supposed to be fun. Yeah, I'm having a real party over here. So where exactly am I supposed to put this stupid apple? They don't really want me to put it in the tree, do they? Oh, you motherfuckers! I hate this game! After completing a room, Mario will then place bricks in front of the door. Now it's time to enter through another door, and you guessed it, kill off more of these stupid turtles. But now, they'll start dropping items that are hard to figure out which time period they come from. Like the steering wheel, for instance. Now where's this go? Well, I guess we'll try 1602. Okay, so drop it here and, uh... Ah, damn it! And here comes that stupid bird again! Why, you little shit! I got a bird of my own for ya! Oh, oh, you're playing a Mario game! You mind if I watch? Ronnie, I don't have time for your crap today. Get the hell out of here! Oi, V, what a grouch! If you mess up at any point in Mario's time machine, you'll be forced to go back and kill more of these stupid damn turtles. After you've killed them off again, they now drop a quill pen. Well, let's try taking this over to Gettysburg. Makes sense, right? Oh, come on, again?! Yeah, take that, asshole! So after going back and killing a shitload of more turtles, they now drop a sledgehammer. Hey, now I definitely know where this one goes. In the 1980s, Peter Gabriel did have a hit song called Sledgehammer. Sledgehammer. So 1989, here we come. Alright, let's see if this works. Well, hot damn, another success! Yeah, brick that shit up, Mario! At last, we come to the final door. But before you can enter, you're given a pop quiz and all the information you should have been reading throughout the game. And you did remember to read all this stuff, right? Well, shit, me neither. Oh well, we'll just consult the Nintendo Power magazine. So just what is behind this big huge door, you ask? Well, nothing more but tons of more turtles! Holy shit, look at them all! What? Actually, I'm just messing with you. Because the last boss, in fact, is Bowser. And just like every other pathetic enemy in this game, he won't be able to hurt you. So after defeating him, because you will defeat him, you get to free your pal Yoshi. But wait a minute, how the hell did Yoshi get caught in the first place? I thought this bozo was outside waiting for me after dropping me off at the beginning of the game. So what the hell? So Mario's time machine is a piece of shit. Now if you thought the NES version was bad, you ain't seen nothing yet, because they also made a version of Mario's Time Machine for the Super Nintendo. Again Mario's given the task of returning items to the past that Bowser has stolen. In the main area, you'll have the option of picking from five items, and after picking one, it's then time to consult your history book and activate your time machine. And wait a minute, everything now has to be inputted manually? Holy shit, I'll be here all day! And the worst part is that you just don't go straight to the next level. Oh no. Instead, you'll be transported to a surfing board level. Now what the hell does this have to do with time travel? Jumping gigawatts! Just give me a flex capacitor so I can get the hell out of here. What the hell's that smell? Oh well, I'm sure it's nothing. Now if you thought the NES version was bad, you ain't seen nothing yet. Because they also made a version of Mario's Missing for the Super Nintendo. So now we have Mario's Missing for the 16-bit console. And with this version, we get levels that are twice as big. So that can only mean more of this damn walking bullshit. Great. Now you can try to save time by jumping into these pipes, because they do end up warping you around the city. 
Half the time they'll come in handy by sending you in the direction you're heading, but other times they'll transport you totally out of your way. What the hell? Whoa! Okay, so after you've found one of the three missing items, it's time to return it and answer more of the receptionist's stupid questions. Answer them correctly, and she'll take back the stolen item. Answer them wrong, and she'll get all pissy with you. I'll find you, stupid bitch. I'll just keep the stupid item. Hell, I always wanted the Westminster Abbey anyway. What the hell's that smell? Huh, smells like a gas leak. I'll go fix it. Oh, well thanks, Ronnie. Boy, it's a good thing he was here. So after answering correctly, she'll take the item from you, and the building will be open for business. Do this in all three locations, and you'll finish out the level. Just like in the NES version, there are a total of 14 levels to complete. So that means tons of turtle searching, townspeople talking, and pointless question answering. Who painted the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel? Leonardo, Michelangelo, Donatello, or Splinter? <laughs> okay, you know what, that's probably the most amusing thing you'll find in this entire game. But as for everything else, it just seems like walking, walking, and more boring walking. And these clips are sped up by 300%, so imagine this game at normal speed. Well, there you go. I fixed the gas leak for you. Already? Boy, that was quick. Yeah, well, I'm a quick worker. Wow. Well, thanks, Ronnie. You probably saved my life. Yeah, I know. Just wait till you get my bill. What? So after arriving at your time period in Mario's time machine, it's time to talk to the local townspeople. Because in order to advance in the level, you're required to fill in the blanks of your history book first. Now in any other game, you'd have the option to pick the answer from four different choices. Not four fucking hundred! Holy shit! And there's really no reason for this! So after filling out this stupid book, it's time to take the item to its rightful owner, and your job here will be complete. But if you try returning the item before the history book is filled out, they'll tell you to piss off! Well, same to you, Sir Isaac, asshole! Who knew that Sir Isaac Newton was such a dick? And where the hell's that smell coming from? Now, Mario's time machine has a total of 15 boring levels to play through. And if you can stay awake long enough to reach the last boss, you'll receive one of two different endings. If you finish the stages in the correct order, you'll send Bowser back to the Stone Age and watch him as he gets flattened by a dinosaur's foot, Monty Python style. But if you complete these stages out of order, you still get to send Bowser back to the Stone Age. But this time, there is no dinosaur foot. Oh, well that's just great. You know what's worse than playing a boring ass game for over four hours? Playing a boring ass game for over four hours and finding out you got the shittier ending! Well, I guess the only thing left to do now is to burn this piece of shit out of existence. Throughout the game Mario is missing, Luigi travels to places like China, Paris, Australia, and even through the streets of Mexico City. Hey, what's this guy want? Give me your wallet! Those damn banditos! So after completing all the levels in this game, you'll finally be able to release Mario from his prison. And it's about damn time, too. I'm not even sure why the hell Luigi had to travel around the world in the first place. In fact, they could have just called this game National Lampoon's Luigi's Vacation, and nobody would really be the wiser. Boy, that looks fun. I would love to travel to all those places. Yeah, I'd definitely second that. Oh yeah? Well then, let's-a go! Oh, oh, really? This'll be great! Alright! 